my name is Margaret Rung, and I'm a history professor here at Roosevelt. I'm also the director of the Center for New Deal Studies. Um, first, I'd like to welcome to the podium Dr. Ali Malekzadeh, president of Roosevelt University. Well, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, a heartfelt thank you to Professor Rung for bringing us here together today. Uh, and this is related to the discussion today. How many of you have voted already? If you haven't voted, I don't want to talk to you. Yes, please vote. We're going to start taking back our country today. Now, our university was founded in 1945, right at the end of World War II, uh, by a group of faculty and students who believed in the principle of equal treatment. Inspired by Franklin Roosevelt's leadership and commitment to that principle, they reached out to Eleanor Roosevelt uh, to ask if we might name the university after her husband and herself. She embraced it, she joined our advisory board, and uh, she even brought in Albert Einstein to join the board. And that's part of the legacy of our university. So we honor that history, especially with the Center for New Deal Studies, um, to hear about the Roosevelt's, and also in this annual program, as Professor Rong mentioned, the 25th anniversary of this program with distinguished lectures. Uh, before we go on, uh, I absolutely want to take just one moment to have a moment of silence for our colleagues who were massacred in the Tree of Life Light Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Uh, it is our job to stop hate every single day. And then this lecture will give us a sense of that throughout our history and the Holocaust that was based on hate. So let's remember that as we go through the lecture by a distinguished colleague from Northwestern University. Um, I would like to thank each of you for being here today. Uh, I also would like to thank Margaret Rung one more time for her leadership in making today's lecture possible. Now, coming together for this special lecture is our way of keeping history alive, not forgetting and learning from the past and moving toward a tomorrow that matches the mission of Roosevelt University, which is social justice. So, Professor Rung. Thank you so much, President Malexa Day. Thank you um, for your support. I'd also like to just offer a couple of thanks to people who have contributed significantly to this event, um, members of the Center for New Deal Studies Advisory Board, who are with us today. I'd like to thank Julie Rowan, the Assistant Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, who, I know, she is too awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's, she helps with everything from the small to the big um, task. I want to thank Grace Mary Perez, who is the Graduate Assistant uh, for the Center for New Deal Studies. Thank you, Grace, for all your work. Um, I would like to thank Monique Mitchell and the marketing team for their fine work. And finally, gratitude as well to the AV and physical resources teams for assistance with all things technical. Today we're gathering for the 25th iteration of this program, which began in 1992 under the leadership of former College of Arts and Sciences Dean Ron Tallman, then Associate Dean Lynn Weiner, and Ann Roosevelt 
daughter of James Roosevelt and granddaughter of Franklin and Eleanor. When they launched this program, they did so as a means of honoring the vision and legacy of the university's namesakes. In 1995, with the founding of the Center for New Deal Studies under the directorship of Lynn Weiner, the center took ownership of the annual program, making it a signature event on the university's calendar. We owe our appreciation to Lynn, Ron, and Anne for creating this tradition so that we, as the next generation, may carry on the conversation about the Roosevelt vision for a more just world. As we congregate here, thank you, Lynn. As we congregate here this afternoon at this moment in time to reflect on this year's lecture, The Roosevelts and the Holocaust, we cannot help but feel the weight of history. On a day when the nation is casting votes to determine the political direction of the nation amidst an atmosphere of racism, misogyny, xenophobia, and classism, it's not hard to glance back at the 1930s and wonder what Americans were thinking as they witnessed the rise of fascism in Europe and Asia. How did they respond to Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, on November 9th and 10th, 1938, almost 80 years ago to the day? What did Franklin and Eleanor think of these ominous developments? What did they do? When news of the deportation and murder of the Jewish population in Europe reached the United States, how did the Republic and the Roosevelts address or fail to address this atrocity? Answers to these questions may make us uncomfortable. They may disappoint us as a university proud of its namesakes. But I think the larger point is to ask how this history encourages us to think more critically about our own choices in the face of grave injustices. How does this knowledge shape our response to violations of human rights? How does, how does it illuminate our own critical role in selecting leaders who project our values? Today's speaker, Dr. Daniel Green, will explore these topics and many others with his lecture, The Roosevelts and the Holocaust. He comes to us with an impressive career as a scholar, curator, and public intellectual committed to social justice. An expert in Jewish history, Holocaust studies, and the history of pluralism, Dr. Green has lectured widely across the United States about these topics. The author of The Jewish Origins of Cultural Pluralism, The Menorah Association in American Diversity, as well as numerous articles in scholarly journals, Dr. Green has contributed significantly to our understanding of how American pluralism is understood and constructed. Throughout his career, Dr. Green has taken his knowledge of history and put it in service of the public, curating exhibits at the Newberry Library on daily life in the Civil War North and Honest Abe of the West, as well as at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum with an exhibit entitled A Dangerous Lie, The Protocols of, Elder, of the Elders of Zion. Named a curator and historian for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. in 2014, he began work on a major exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust, which opened to significant acclaim this past April. Heralded as powerful, challenging, provocative, ingenious, and even-handed by reviewers, the exhibition has been covered in the Chicago Tribune, The Guardian, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, Washington Post, and numerous other periodicals, as well as on various television and radio programs. Based on meticulous research conducted in newspapers, magazines, newsreels, radio shows, and archives across the country, Americans in the Holocaust challenges traditional narratives about what Americans knew and when they knew it. But equally critically, it situates American action and inaction within the specific historical context of the 1930s and 1940s. His lecture today on the Roosevelts and the Holocaust is drawn from the extensive research he conducted for this major exhibition. In addition to his position as a historian at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Dr. Green teaches history at Northwestern University and continues to share his experience in public history through workshops, seminars, conferences, and symposia throughout the nation. We are truly, truly honored that he is with us today to talk about the Roosevelts and the Holocaust. Please welcome Dr. Green. Um, thanks, Dr. Rung, for that. Um, 
very nice introduction, um, and, to, and to President Malexade for being here, and to all of you for coming today. Um, Dr. Rung just raised a bunch of difficult questions, um, and she, she sort of uh, stole my intro but, uh, by doing so, but I appreciate it. Um, our view of history in this exhibition, and my view of, of studying history, is not to hand people a, a, a neat package with a bow on it and say, here's what you should think. Um, these are difficult questions to think, to think about. Um, and I want to think today with you about some enduring questions that come out of the Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust, um, but that endure today. Questions like, what are Americans' responsibilities when they see a democracy fall apart? How do we debate our responsibility to refugees? How do Americans debate whether or not to enter a war when most Americans consider it a foreign war? And then, critically, when we know that a population abroad is targeted for murder in a genocide, what do we do about it? How do we debate those responsibilities? The Roosevelt's are at the center of what I'm gonna talk about today, um, but part of the entire takeaway of the, of, of the whole exhibition in, in Washington um, at the Holocaust Memorial Museum is that this is the responsibility of all Americans to, to debate. Um, we ask when our leaders follow public opinion and when they try to pull the public along. You'll, you'll see that, for, for example, today. Um, and, I, and one of the things that I wanna talk about is the context. Too often when we study the Holocaust, we lift the Holocaust out of history, whether out of European history. Often you see the Holocaust talked about as if there wasn't a war going on. Um, but it, of course, it's the war that makes the Holocaust possible. So um, what we try to do in this exhibition and what I'm gonna try to do today is also put the, put Americans' response to Nazism back in the context of American history. And to do that, we need to look back even before FDR becomes president um, to think about what America looked like coming out of World War I. Coming out of World War I, Americans thought it was a mistake to have entered World War I. Um, you, here you see a veteran on the street um, with a, wearing a, a sign that says, I gave my eyes. Americans are war weary coming out of World War I. We're an isolationist nation coming out of World War I. We pull back from international affairs. Um, Americans were asked repeatedly in the 1930s by Gallup, was it a mistake to enter World War I? And usually about 70% of Americans say yes, it was a mistake. We're an isolationist nation in terms of immigrants as well. The United States passes restrictive immigration quota laws in 1924 that, that severely limit the number of immigrants that we're gonna let into the country each year. Um, Asians um, are restricted entirely, and Europeans are categorized um, in a hierarchy of, of white European races based very much on um, ideas around eugenic science that hold sway in America during the 1920s, not only in Germany. These laws in 1924 are fully, it's, it's nine years before Hitler comes to power, but, and we have our own restrictive immigration laws that are gonna uh, influence in a drastic way how we respond to the refugee crisis that Europe, Europe's Jews faced in the 1930s. We're a xenophobic nation. You see the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Here they are marching outside the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Obviously um, a racist organization, a deeply anti-Semitic organization, and, and something that's often forgotten about the, the KKK in the 1920s, um, a, a deeply anti-Catholic organization also. What these restrictionist organizations try to do is draw boundaries around who can be an American. And the KKK is trying to tell Americans at the time that African Americans, Jews, Catholics can't be Americans. Um, it's Jim Crow America, it's a segregated America. And that segregation is enforced through law and it's also enforced through violent action. And so all these preconditions, we have these preconditions that set out a number of fears that Americans hold and then the bottom drops out of the economy in 1929. Um, and here, this, um, I can't resist locating this um, photograph for you. This is a soup kitchen on State Street in the 900 block of South State in Chicago. It's run by Al Capone um, as a kind of PR um, move. But we have 25% we have unemployment by the 1930s. Um, and most Americans don't own stock in the 1930s, but the stock market drops by 90% to give you a sense of, of that, of the economic crisis. So these conditions at home, economic insecurity, 
racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, war weariness, a pulling back from the world, all come before the rise of Nazism. Uh, and, and it's very much what Roosevelt runs on in, in 1932. Um, you can see Roosevelt right here in the car um, at this campaign rally before the election of, of November 32, abolish bread lines, vote for Roosevelt. Those are all the preconditions. What does Roosevelt tell Americans on this first day as president, March 4th of 1933? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We have so much to fear, right? You don't say that. I, I, in a way, he's, he's being a parent to the nation, right? You don't tell a child to be afraid unless they're afraid of something, right? We have so many things to be afraid of, and, and, and Roosevelt is trying to, to rally us around not letting fear have such a grip on, on American politics. Um, and then, in 1933, we look abroad and we see this. We see Hitler rise to power. Uh, and there's a, there's a misconception in the public. We tested this, actually, many, many times as we put together this exhibition. There's a, there's a misconception in the public that Americans didn't have information about Nazism during the 1930s and 40s. And the opposite is true. And, it, and you didn't have to be reading the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, the newsreels covered Nazism widely. The radio covered Nazism. Um, wire service stories, AP wire service stories, UP wire service stories, were picked up across the country. So this, this narrative that Nazism wasn't in the news is wrong. And if you think about difficult questions in history, if, if it's, it's sort of easy for us to say as Americans, well, we didn't know anything, so we didn't do much in response. But the harder question is to realize how much in access to information Americans had about Nazism, and then to ask why rescue of Jews never became a priority. And that's one of the things that we try to answer. But just to give you a couple examples, Hitler on the cover of Vanity Fair in November of 1932, frequently on the cover of Time Magazine. He's a new world leader. Of course, American magazines and newspapers are covering him. And one of the things that's critical to understand is that this coverage Gets, gets it right that anti-Semitism is essential to Nazi ideology. One example, Joseph Goebbels is the Nazi minister of propaganda. He's on the cover of Time magazine on July 10th of 1933, and I've just pulled out on the side the, the language from the cover of the magazine. Say it in your dreams, the Jews are to blame. Um, this is a 5,000-word article in this issue, a very long article um, about how essential anti-Semitism is to, to Nazi ideology. Nazis explain the world by blaming Jews, um, is, is what a reader of time would have, could have understood in July of 33. Now, don't get me wrong here. This doesn't mean that Americans should have known that mass murder was coming. Mass murder begins in the summer of 1941, fully eight years later. But we can't say, and, and we always have to push against hindsight, right, and try to empathize with historical actors to think about what did Americans know in 1933. One of the things they knew is that anti-Semitism was core to Nazi ideology, even if they couldn't imagine that mass murder of millions was coming. The Nazis haven't imagined it yet. The Nazis don't have a plan for mass murder in 1933, um, but, but they're in the news. Uh, our, early government response um, is concern, but a respect for Germany's national sovereignty. This man on the right is William Dodd. He, FDR nominates him to be, or selects him to be, the ambassador to Germany in the summer of 1933. Many of you may know Eric Larson's book, In the Garden of Beasts, about, about Dodd. Uh, Dodd was a University of Chicago history professor who thought this was going to be a quiet position where he could go get some writing done. Um, he was well in over his head. But FDR, um, this is kind of an as told to quote, um, but Dodd recorded in his diary that FDR told him the German authorities are treating Jews shamefully and the Jews in this country, in America, are greatly excited, but this is not a governmental affair. Whatever we can do to moderate the general persecution by unofficial and personal influence ought to be done. There are, FDR is basically saying it's not our job as a, as a United States government to defend another country's citizens from its own government. And Jews are still citizens in Germany until, until that citizenship is stripped in 1935. Dodd um, meets with Hitler for the first time in October of 1933. This is the Chicago Tribune covering it. Hitler assures Dodd Yanks will get protection. What is this headline talking about? There were multiple attacks on Americans 
in Germany by the SA, by Nazi thugs, um, at least three dozen attacks in 1933 alone, uh, mostly on American Jews. And, and the US government is very concerned with that because those Americans are our own citizens. So Dodd goes to Hitler, and in their first meeting in October 1933, item number one on the agenda for Dodd is to say, the SA's gotta stop attacking Americans. We need to, uh, this ambassador is gonna protect his own citizens. Um, and Hitler agrees. And for the most part, those attacks do end in 1933. Um, I'm gonna fast forward now to 1938, because 1938 is really when the refugee crisis begins. There are many things that happen in 34, 35, 36, 37 that, that I could talk about, but in 1933, Americans' understanding of Nazism changes. And it changes for a couple reasons. One is that the Nazis annex Austria in March of 1938. Um, and two, as Dr. Rung said, um, there is a nationwide terrorist attack against Jews by the German government, uh, which we now know as Kristallnacht. We're coming up on the 80th anniversary in just a few days. The American press widely reports both these stories. They, 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 they report the Nazi annexation of Austria as well as taking over parts of Czechoslovakia as Hitler has greater territorial ambitions than just Germany. Hitler's gonna encroach on all of Europe. Um, and they report Kristallnacht in banner headlines across American newspapers for weeks in November of 1938. This is the Dallas Morning News. Hysterical Nazis wreck thousands of Jewish shops, burn synagogues in wild orgy of looting and terror. On that night, November 9th and 10th of 1938, 30,000 Jewish men are arrested in Germany and sent to concentration camps. 100 Jews are murdered because they're Jews and thousands of synagogues and shops are destroyed across the nation. Um, and this is all very widely reported. Uh, this is a headline from Los Angeles, fully two weeks after Kristallnacht. Nazis warn world Jews will be wiped out unless evacuated by democracies. How does FDR respond? Here's the Baltimore Sun with a banner headline, Roosevelt denounces Nazis. You can see it says, President shocked by attacks on Jews. So Roosevelt does a few things in November of 1938. Two weeks after Kristallnacht, he gives a press conference. Um, it was his policy to, that press conferences were always off the record, but he opens this one by saying, boys, it's mostly boys, boys, you can quote me to the, to the reporters. Um, and what he says is, I, I myself could scarcely believe that such things could occur in a 20th century civilization. So that is a presidential denunciation. We can debate whether or not that's an action or not. Um, he's asked immediately by reporters, are we gonna let more refugees in? And he says, no, we have a quota system. So he's not willing to, um, to try to use any political capital to change our restrictive immigration system at that point. Um, his Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, convinces him to, waive, to, to allow around 12,000 German Jews who are here in the United States at the time on something called tourist visas. A tourist visa is, is just that. It allows a tourist to travel with a very short expiration date. And Francis Perkins convinces FDR to waive the expiration date of all, for, of all the tourist visas for um, Germans who are in the United States at that time. It may be as many as 12,000 people. Historians debate that. And 12,000 is, of course, a small number compared to 6 million. We know that in hindsight. And again, I'd encourage you to read history forward. Um, for those 12,000 people, that, that made the difference. Um, but, but um, and Roosevelt recalls the ambassador from Germany. He recalls the U.S. ambassador. We're the only nation in the world that recalls our ambassador from Germany after Kristallnacht. Uh, Americans take to the streets after Kristallnacht, carrying signs like this, stop Hitler, bloody pogroms. Pogroms are violent riots um, against Jews and Catholics. You see the one down here, America greets Roosevelt's recall of ambassador to Germany. Um, so Americans know about this and they, and they take to the streets to protest it. Gallup starts to, Gallup public opinion polling. Gallup had been founded as an organization in 1935, so it's, 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 a, it's in its infancy in the 1930s, but it starts polling Americans. And two weeks after Kristallnacht, it asks Americans this question. 
Do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? And, and look how overwhelming it is, right? 94% of Americans disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany. And so then they're asked in the same poll this question. Should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And 72% say no. And this is one of the most difficult things to wrestle with in this history, is Americans' own response is to, to, to crises abroad, to atrocities abroad, is so often disapproval without action on behalf of the victims. One of the difficult questions around this history is why don't Americans cross that bridge from disapproval to action on behalf of, of the victims of atrocities? And if you look at subsequent genocides since the Holocaust, you see actually very similar numbers in terms of Americans' disapproval of bad stuff happening over there and an idea that that bad stuff is either not our problem or not something that we can do something about or should do something about. Um, no matter what Americans learn over the course of the next seven years till the end of, the, of World War II, you're not gonna see this number move very much on our responsibility to Jewish exiles. And in fact, you don't see it move very much in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust either. Um, in 1939, Congress has a particularly interesting response to Kristallnacht. They introduced this bill. Um, it's a bipartisan bill, of course, something we wish there were more of today. Uh, this is, it's sponsored by Senator Robert Wagner out of New York and a congresswoman in Massachusetts named Edith Norse Rogers. So it gets known as the Wagner-Rogers bill for their two names. This bill, introduced in 1939, says, let's let in 10,000 refugee kids every year for two years, 20,000 total, 1939 and 1940, and let's not count those kids against our restrictive immigration quotas. Let's just let in these children as a humanitarian measure. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt writes this telegram, I'm sorry it's a little blurry, to her husband, to, to FDR, um, and she says, um, uh, she asks whether, whether she should speak out about the child refugee bill. He's, he's at sea on the, on the USS Houston, um, actually off the coast of Florida. This is in February of 1939. And he writes back and he says in the third line there, it's best for me to say nothing till I get back, but you can speak out on behalf of the child refugee bill. And she does in many ways. She says, I think it's a wise way to do a humanitarian act. Other nations take their share of child refugees and it seems a fair thing to do. What we're gonna see through the course of this history is Eleanor Roosevelt as a champion of human rights showing up um, in, in a lot of places that, that maybe we wouldn't expect the First Lady to show up. Um, this is February of 1939. She's been First Lady for six years at this point. This is the first time she speaks out in such a public way about any pending legislation. She had worked quietly behind the scenes, or sometimes not so quietly, behind the scenes um, for a lot of humanitarian issues, especially um, segregation, um, and especially trying to get an anti-lynching bill uh, moving through the US Congress, which it never does um, during the Roosevelt administration. But here she's speaking out on behalf of childhood, uh, child refugees who she believes we should be letting into the country outside of our restrictive immigration quotas. She writes about it in her very influential newspaper column My Day, and here she's really speaking about American history more generally. If we study our own history, we find that we've always been ready to receive the unfortunates from other countries. We can debate whether that's true, but she's arguing what the best version of America should be here. Um, and though this may seem a generous gesture on our part, we've profited a thousandfold by what they've brought us. She's telling a story about the nation. The story is we're a nation of immigrants, and those immigrants bring us great culture, great gifts. It's, it's always, for, for, for what, however you define the mainstream, um, they benefit from the influx of immigrants. Um, and, and one of the difficult questions of this history is why is there that big gap between these humanita humanitarian ideals, these stories we tell ourselves about what it means to be an American, and then the realities, the political realities on the ground. 
One of her biggest opponents is this man, Senator Robert Reynolds, a Democrat from North Carolina, um, who's arguing strongly against the bill. He says, my heart goes out in sympathy to refugee children, right? Sympathy without action is a real um, theme here. Um, but my heart beats first in sympathy for American sons and daughters, in preference to the children of fathers and mothers of any other nation of the world. His public argument is American kids are suffering, so why would we be letting in refugee children? The private argument is much more anti-Semitic. Um, the private argument is 10,000 Jewish kids will soon be 10,000 Jewish adults. Um, do we really want them here? And Reynolds, Senator Reynolds finally goes to the sponsor of the bill, Senator Robert Wagner from New York, and he says, look, I'll let you have your bill. Um, you can have your bill. You will let in 20,000 kids if, in exchange, we shut down immigration to absolute zero for the next five years. And Wagner will not take that compromise, and he pulls the bill, um, and the bill never makes it off the floor, out of, out of committee, onto the floor for a, for a vote. So the, so the United States never, never has any equivalent to something like the kinder transport, which you, you may know about, where Great Britain lets in about 10,000 unaccompanied children during this period. Part of the reason we don't have it is the American people are against it. Gallup asks, it's been proposed that the government permit 10,000 refugee children into this country to be taken into American homes. Do you approve of this plan? Two-thirds of Americans don't approve of letting in refugee children in 1939 outside of our restrictive immigration laws. Um, things change for America then um, when Europe goes to war. Germany invades Poland in September of 1939. Europe goes to war. What's on Americans' minds when Europe goes to war? The polls show us the two things are on Americans' minds. Staying out, 90% of Americans want to stay out of the European war in, in 1939, according to Gallup. Staying out is number one, and keeping refugees out is number two during, during this war. And what we're gonna see FDR do before Pearl Harbor, there's about you know, two years and two months until December of 1941. He's gonna spend all of his political capital trying to change American public opinion on that question of whether or not to go into war. And he's gonna spend none of his political capital on the question of uh, trying to change public opinion on, on refugees. So here's Americans reading headlines about war the next day, September 2nd of 1939. And FDR takes to the air, um, as he often does, using a fireside chat just two days later, September 3rd, 1939. He gets on the radio and he reassures Americans this nation will remain a neutral nation. Um, but I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. We're anti-Nazi, but we're not willing to fight for it at, at this point, is, is, is what Roosevelt is saying. Part of the reason is there's a vigorous anti-war movement um, when Europe goes to war, even before Europe goes to war. Here's a protester at the White House hanging signs um, that apparently only stayed up for a few minutes before they were ripped down. FDR, you're preparing for war, you fight it. Um, in 1940, um, as other Western European nations are falling, that, isola that isolationism um, is reinforced by a deep fear of spies in the United States. Um, when France falls in May of 1940, Americans can't explain why France fell so quickly and one, to the Nazis, and one of the, re one of the ways they explain it is to say, there must have been spies all over France before it fell, um, infiltrating from within, taking the country down from within, and we have to be very concerned here at home, there might be Nazi spies here as well. FDR gives a fireside chat about that in May 1940. He says, today's threat to national security is not just about military weapons. Um, he talks about a fifth column, that's the language for, for, of, of the time for spies, the fifth column that betrays a nation unprepared for treachery. Spies, saboteurs, and traitors are the actors in this new strategy. The head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, is out there in the public also ginning up uh, fear about spies. 71% of Americans believe that there are Nazi spies all over the United States by June of 1940. So it, we're still a nation gripped by fear, um, and, and this fear of spies effectively shuts the door to refugees because the, the rumors start to circulate that the Nazis will send spies here um, posing as refugees. 
And so within the State Department, who are responsible, they're, they're the gatekeepers for letting refugees in, the instructions to the State Department is, if you have any doubts about national security in terms of immigrants, you don't let them in. Um, and so that, that wins the day. Um, FDR, this is Wendell Wilkie, who runs against FDR in 1940. FDR spending a lot of his political capital um, doing something that's unprecedented in American history, which is gearing up to run for, for a third term and uses national security fears uh, in, in, in many measures. Um, the 1940 election was close, um, but F FDR um, prevails over, over Wilkie. Wilkie is arguing, this is a, a Wilkie um, pamphlet that was handed out during the, during the election, a third term means war. Roosevelt plus third term equals war. Wilkie plus defense equals peace. Wilkie's out there saying, if you elect Roosevelt, we'll be at war by the spring of 1941. He's, he's close. We're at war by, by the end of 1941. You see um, Americans wearing buttons like this, no third term. Um, this one on the bottom right is really, um, I had never seen this before working on this exhibition. Third international, third Reich, third term. Um, people start to argue that Roosevelt is an American dictator by, by running for a third term. We need Wilkie, not dictatorship. And then we have a vigorous anti-war movement in an organization known as the America First Committee. Um, this is a propaganda poster for the America First Committee that th this poster is basically telling you that liberty itself will be the first casualty of war. Um, the America First Committee is founded at Yale University in the fall of 1941 by students, but it quickly moves to Chicago. You might not be able to see, but the address on the bottom of the poster is 141 West Jackson, Chicago. Um, it's based in Chicago because there's such a rank and file of isolation isolationists in the Midwest. Um, and the loudest spokesperson for this isolationist organization is this man on the left, Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh may be the most famous American in 1940 after FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, he had flown across the Atlantic solo in 1927. Um, his son had been, his uh, one-year-old son had been kidnapped and murdered during the 1930s, leading to a um, kind of what, what was called in the 1930s the trial of the century. Uh, Lindbergh is a staunch isolationist, and he becomes the spokesperson of America First. You'd see him speaking at rallies like this. Here he is at the podium. They, America First always loved to use George Washington's image because in George Washington's farewell address, he said no entangling alliances, right? That the United States should stay out of entangling alliances. And the isolationists um, capitalize on that rhetoric to say Washington would have been an isolationist if he were around today. Um, I want to tell you just about one speech that Lindbergh gives in Des Moines, Iowa on September 11th, 1941. Uh, Lindbergh, it, it, this is a speech about what he calls war agitators. And he says, look, there's three groups that want America to go to war. The first group that wants America to go to war are the British. And he admits this makes sense. The British are now the last line of defense against Nazism. He says the second group that wants us to go to war is FDR and his administration because FDR is a warmonger and because he's been lying to you and he needs this war to stay popular and he needs this war to lift the economy. And then he says the third group that wants us to go to war are the Jews. And then he threatens Jews in America. He says in this speech that America has been a tolerant land for Jews up until this point, 1941. Again, we could debate that, but that's the story that Lindbergh tells. He says, America's been a tolerant land for Jews, and if we go to war in a way that's perceived as a war for the Jews, then there will be a great backlash of discrimination here in the United States. We're already talking about a height of anti-Semitism in American history in the 1930s and 1940s. Polls show anti-Semitism on the rise in America in the 1930s and 40s. Um, but Lindbergh threatens the Jews in this speech, and then he slips into all these really common anti-Semitic tropes. He says, look at all the messages in the media telling you to go to war. Why? because Jews control the media, right? A very common anti-Semitic trope where he says, look at all the interventionist films coming out of Hollywood at this point. Well, there, these interventionist films are coming out because the Jews control Hollywood as well. Um, these are some of the most common anti-Semitic lies um, in, uh, in history ab about secret Jewish control of a society. The response to Lindbergh's speech is actually very negative. The press starts to ask, is Lindbergh a Nazi? 
um, or uh, many label him a Nazi sympathizer at that point. And he, he goes quiet after this speech. And I can't prove this, but I think that Lindbergh is saying out loud what a lot of Americans think privately at that, at that September 1941 speech. One of the best responses to Lindbergh comes from a, pol a political cartoonist um, named Theodore Geisel. We, we know him as Dr. Seuss. This is you know fully 15 years or so before he, Green Eggs and Ham and books like that. But um, he's, he's working for a left-leaning um, newspaper out of New York called PM. Um, and drawing fantastic anti-isolationist, anti-America first cartoons. Here um, is one of Lindbergh kind of patting a Nazi monster on the head and saying Roosevelt's really the threat here, not Hitler. It's Roosevelt the world should fear. This is Seuss's response to that September 11th, 1941 speech. Um, this ran in PM in September of 1941. You see a mother or maybe a grandmother wearing an America First sweater reading a really sc scary story to her children called Adolf the Wolf. Um, and the caption is, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones. But those were foreign children and it didn't really matter. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, there's a great online exhibition that the University of California, San Diego put together because Seuss's papers are there. Um, it's called Dr. Seuss Goes to War. You can easily look at um, hundreds of these fantastic activist cartoons that he was, that he was drawing. And, and, and the other thing you'll see there um, is some of the more disturbing sides of um, Geisel's legacy, um, especially uh, really deeply racist anti-Japanese um, imagery from some of his cartoons in, in 1940 and 41 as well that, that's reflecting the climate of, of America at the time. Um, war comes to us at home with Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 1941. This isolationist interventionist debate stops as a result of Pearl Harbor. And we see Americans rally um, in a way that I think is hard for us to imagine um, today behind, behind this cause of war. Um, by 1942, um, our first response to war, one of our first responses to war is in the name of national security to round up more than 100,000 um, Japanese people of Japanese ancestry, more than two thirds of them are citizens, and to remove them to inland camps. Um, this is based on, um, again, ginned up fear of, of spies. Here, um, Japanese in Seattle being, being removed forcibly um, to, to inland uh, camps where they were, where they were forcibly held. Um, it's interesting to look at how the press covers this Japanese American removal. Um, Life magazine here is covering Manzanar, uh, one of the one, an infamous camp in in uh, Independence, California. Life magazine calls Manzanar a scenic spot of lonely loveliness, where Japanese will be held, or in their words, Japs will be held for their own protection throughout the war. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you see a magazine like this. This is the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis that calls these concentration camps, which they're not, they're not death camps, but they are concentration camps where um, Japanese Americans are, are forcibly held against their will. And the pull quote down here basically says, look, color is the only reason um, that, that Japanese Americans are being detained. We're not detaining Italian Americans or German Americans in the same numbers. Um, they're our enemies too at, at war. Eleanor Roosevelt goes to these camps. Um, she writes about it in Collier's Magazine in October 1942. She says, we cannot progress if we look down upon any group of people among us because of race or religion. Every citizen in this country has a right to our basic freedoms, to justice and to equality of opportunity. Again, Eleanor Roosevelt is the champion of human rights, um, but most Americans, well over 50% of Americans when they were asked, believed we were doing the right thing in removing Japanese Americans forcibly from their homes. Um, I just want to show you a few images of then how Americans see the war. These are propaganda posters that the government issues in 1943. And on the left, what's the message? The message is Nazism is an enemy of Christianity, right? Or on the right, the swastika ring crumpling our founding documents, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, right? Nazism is an enemy of American values. Nazism is an enemy of American children. Look at the looming swastika in the grass, the shadow of the swastika in the, in the left over these Americana-looking children. What you don't see, of course, 
is the idea that Nazism is an enemy of Europe's Jews. That would not have rallied America. And one of the points we make in the war, in the section of the exhibition on the war, is that the Nazis fight two wars. The Nazis are gonna fight a war against the Allies, and the Nazis are gonna fight a war to destroy the Jews of Europe. And those two wars are equally important to the Nazis. And in response, the Allies are gonna fight one war. The Allies are gonna fight a war to rescue democracy from fascism. They are not gonna fight a war to rescue Jews. And in fact, do, doing much of anything that we would today think of as a humanitarian effort to aid Jews is seen in FDR's administration as a diversion from the purpose of the war. The logic in the FDR administration is you stop killing by stopping the killers. You don't stop killing by rescuing the victims. The killing ends when the killers are gone. This is a logic that we might struggle with today, that many people do struggle with today. Um, a lot of people have a, a moral outrage about this logic. Um, and it, at, at times I share that moral outrage. But I think our approach to history um, can't, can't be what do we wish would have happened, but to look at what did happen and try to struggle with um, explaining why. Um, oh, some of the other propaganda posters you see like this, um, th this is in a sense an American fantasy um, to show African-American workers and white workers together. This may be the first government propaganda poster that does this. We go to war, we go to war for democracy with a segregated army. Um, but we tell ourselves stories like this. Eleanor Roosevelt, again, is one of the champions of trying to, to desegregate the army. Here you see her um, with African-American servicemen. Um, we have to ask, as I said, then the enduring question of how, how do Americans learn about the mass murder of Europe's Jews and, and what do they do about it? Information makes it to the State Department about mass murder of Jews from a, an organization called the World Jewish Congress. The representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland sends this telegram, um, August 29th, 1942, and the, it may be hard to read the telegram, but about halfway, or the third line down, um, at the end of the second line, really, in Fuhrer's headquarters, planned, discussed, and under consideration, all Jews in countries occupied or controlled Germany, number three and a half to four million, should after deportation and concentration in East at one blow exterminated to resolve once and for all Jewish question in Europe. We don't have all the details, but we have the story. If you, th if, if you ask yourself, what's the story? The story is the Nazis want to deport millions of Jews to the East and murder them in murder factories. That story is well known in our intelligence community by the summer of 1942, and it's public information by November of 1942. This is November 25th, 1942, the LA Times, Nazis wiping out Jews in cold blood. You could see headlines like this across the country. Edward R. Murrow, one of the most famous journalists, takes to the radio and tells Americans on CBS radio that this is what's happening. Um, this is a letter from a 10-year-old um, in Brooklyn to President Roosevelt, just to give you the sense of what could Americans have known. This is a 10-year-old who is um, Jewish, but he's writing to President Roosevelt and he says, I'm writing to you at this very sad day, December 2nd, 1942. There was an international day of mourning for, for, at that time, what was two million Jewish dead in Europe, um, to ask you to try your very best to stop the manslaughter throughout Europe. They're all innocent Jews, but yet those cold-blooded Nazis kill and slaughter those poor innocent Jews. So this was public information in America, but it never became the, the U.S. government's priority to, to rescue Jews. In December of 1942, the month after it becomes public information, this is a front page article from the New York Times, the allies, the 11 allied nations condemn the Nazis. You can see the words cold-blooded extermination appearing on the front page of the New York Times. And they issue this declaration, and the declaration promises full punishment of the perpetrators. It basically says we're not gonna make the same mistake we made in World War I. We're not gonna have a negotiated peace we're gonna win this war, and there will be full punishment of the perpetrators. It says nothing, it promises nothing about rescue for the victims. 
And that's our consistent policy all along is punishment, win, defeat Nazism, punish the perpetrators. This war is not about rescue of Jews. Um, Americans, um, about half of Americans, 48% when they're asked in July of 1943, believe it's true that two million Jews have been killed in Europe before the war began. And actually, um, you'll see this number tick up over the course of the war. By late 1944, Americans are asked again, Americans are asked, do you believe Germans are murdering Jews in concentration camps? And by that point, 76% of Americans say they believe it. But when they're asked the numbers, when Gallup asks them how many Jews do you think have been murdered, most Jews can't fathom that it's more than about 100,000. This is the end of 1944 when it's more than 5 million. So even as Americans start to grasp that this crime is happening, they can't grasp the scale and scope of the crime. Even though, again, they're reading about it. Um, a New Republic article by a, um, a Varian Fry, actually a great rescuer in this history, um, saying nearly two million Jews have already been slain since the war began. The remaining five million are now living under Nazi control, are scheduled to be destroyed as soon as Hitler's blonde butchers can get around to them. And this is admittedly a very highbrow magazine for America at the time, but. Time is a middlebrow magazine, uh, and Himmler, the architect of genocide, is on the cover of Time in October of 1943 as it's happening. Um, a quote from the article says, Himmler and his trained Gestapo animals have organized a program of extermination without parallel. Um, at the end of the war, this man, Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, his staff in the Treasury Department learns that the State Department is actively obstructing information um, and actively obstructing aid to refugees in Europe. And I, I won't tell the whole story, but it, Morgenthau takes this information to FDR, and FDR issues an executive order creating a new body called the War Refugee Board. The United States to that point had never had a refugee policy. We, we talk as Americans about refugees in the 1930s and 40s, but it doesn't mean anything in law. We don't have a refugee policy really in the United States until 1951. Um, when, we have an, when the UN passes an international um, refugee convention. Um, but the War Refugee Board's job is to rescue Jews. The fine print is rescue Jews as long as it doesn't impede the war effort. The war is still first. FDR takes to the radio again in March of 1944 and tells Americans this, one of the blackest crimes of all history begun by the Nazis, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. By this point, we're late in the Holocaust, um, but the president is telling Americans um, exactly what's going on. One of the things that the War Refugee Board does is bring in 982 refugees and hold the, to a camp in Oswego, New York, upstate New York. It holds them there behind barbed wire. Um, this is a refugee boy on one side of the camp talking to residents of Oswego on the other side of the camp. It doesn't admit them as immigrants, and it actually makes them, the United States makes these refugees sign papers that say when the war ends, we'll go back to Europe. Um, they hope that this humanitarian gesture will be um, an example to other nations of the world, which it doesn't turn out to be. Uh, and ultimately, these refugees are held until February of 1946. Tru Truman, after FDR's death, does admit them as, as immigrants. Eleanor Roosevelt goes there, too, to Oswego. Um, here she is touring Oswego, um, and she writes about it. Restrictions are plentiful, and there's much work to be done around the place, but at least the menace of death is not ever present, she tells Americans. So where are we at the end of this history? Um, I started by telling you that I'm not gonna put a neat bow on it for you, and there's, there's, there's a kind of on the one hand, on the other hand, at the end of the, at the, end of the war, in April and May of 1945. FD, here's FDR giving his fourth inaugural address in January of 1945. He's too ill even really to make it to the Capitol, so he does it from the portico of the White House. Um, it's very, very brief. Um, prints out to about a page or two, um, and he says, what have we learned in this year of war, 1945? He, he tells Americans, we've learned to be citizens of the world. What he means by that is we can't be an isolationist nation anymore. In that way, America has been transformed by this war. We, we are not an isolationist nation by uh, 1945, and 
we won't be for a, for a long time um, to, to come. Um, he meets world leaders at Yalta, like um, Churchill shown here, and makes plans for, for a post-war world. Um, but what's going on over there, here you see Eisenhower walking into Ordruf, which is a subcamp of the Buchenwald concentration camp in April of 1945. Eisenhower can't believe what he's seeing. He has, he's the head of the, of the Allied command. He had access to information, but when he sees it with his own eyes, he can't believe it. And he says, we need to do two things immediately. We need to send U.S. newspaper editors here to see this, and we need Congress to tour these camps. And, and within weeks, actually, members of Congress and members of the U.S. press are there. But as, I, as Eisenhower is walking into order, if this is what's happening in the United States. Our president, for 12 years, has died. Um, Americans have this on, on their mind, FDR um, dying, and as you can see on the top left here, Truman taking office. Um, by May of 1945, May 8th, this is Times Square, May 8th, celebrating Victory in Europe Day, right? We go to war to defeat Nazism, we won. The boys are coming home. Americans are celebrating in May of 1945. This is May 8th. If Americans picked up Life magazine on May, May 7th, the day before, really the most popular magazine in the United States, they would have seen these atrocities. A boy walking along the side of the road um, with bodies littered in Bergen-Belsen and pictures of the Buchenwald concentration camp. Life magazine does two things in this, in this spread. One of the things it does is say, we've been told for 12 years about Nazi atrocities, but now we can no longer doubt it. And I've been up here telling you about how much information Americans had, but they didn't have visual evidence. We didn't have visual evidence of the atrocities. When we think about the Holocaust today, think about the images that come to your head, right? For my students, much of it is, you know, images of Auschwitz or of death camps. That's not how Americans envisioned Nazism in the 1930s and 40s because they didn't see the atrocities of the Holocaust really until April and May of, of 1945. The other thing that this Life magazine does or doesn't do is it doesn't mention Jews. There's no, um, much like so much of our understanding of Nazism during the 1930s and 40s, this talks about political prisoners in these camps, but doesn't foreground the Nazis' plan to destroy all the Jews of Europe. Eleanor Roosevelt tours displaced person camps in 1946, and I'll, I'll close with this. You know, we go to war to defeat Nazism, not to rescue Jews. So winning the war doesn't solve the problem for Europe's Jews. Many of them become displaced refugees, and we see that at the end of wars. Often ending a war doesn't, doesn't solve a problem for the refugees from that war. Eleanor Roosevelt tours DP camps in 1946, and she comes back, and she gives a talk in New York where she says, I have the feeling that we let our consciences realize too late the need of standing up against something that we knew was wrong. I hope that in the future we're going to remember that there can be no compromise at any point with the things that we know are wrong. And I wanted to end with this. It's, it, it really is such an honor to, to speak about her, Eleanor Roosevelt, and, um, and about her role in this history in a place um, that, that I know was so, was so important to her. So thank you very much for that. So I think we, thanks. I think we have um, we have time for questions, and we'll yeah, we we'll have time for questions. So I have a microphone. If if you would like to ask a question, I can hand it out. All right. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Hi. Green. Um, I was wondering, we you, we um, we didn't spend very you didn't spend very much time on um, 1938, which was also a midterm election, right? And I was wondering Thanks. how that influenced. Um, choices Roosevelt made at the time. Thanks. So that's a great question. I looked this up this morning and I meant to talk about it and I didn't. So um, we're on midterm day. One thing to understand is that FDR is very weak in November of 1938. Um, Kristallnacht was November 9th. It was a Wednesday night. The midterms had been that Tuesday. Um, in those midterms, Democrats lost 72 seats in the House. Um, but they still controlled the House by 90 seats after that midterm, so it shows you what a massive majority that they had. And they lost seven seats in the Senate, 
in those midterms, but they still held the Senate by 68 to 23 after losing those seven seats. Uh, so, F, but FDR feels weak, as most presidents are in their second term midterms, uh, very weak. The other reason that we're at the bottom of FDR's popularity, I think in his 12 years, is there's two reasons. One is the court packing scandal had been in 1937. Very unpopular effort by him to add Supreme Court justices. Um, one, of the, one of the lowest moments of his presidency um, politically. And the economy had crashed again in 37 and the economy was not good in 38. So you don't have this linear fix to the Great Depression. To the, the economy improves a little bit, 34, 35, 36, and then in 37, unemployment goes back to 20%. So he's at one of his weakest moments. It may have influenced the way that he did or did not respond to, to Kristallnacht. I think, and I follow historians like Robert Dalek on this who have written so much about Roosevelt, um, one of the things he learns from the Supreme Court packing scandal is don't fight battles you can't win. Um, he doesn't fight a lot of battles he can't win after that, and I think that he knows there's no way he's going to win um, the battle to change public opinion on refugees, and he doesn't really try. So um, when you talked about context and that context of the Great Depression, it does not surprise me at all in the Gallup polls that Americans you know, disagree with how um, Jews are being treated or, uh, in Germany by the Nazis, but are against bringing them in. Um, 25 or a third of unemployment, that's an average. Some cities, as you know, were 80% unemployed. Right. So right. to me, I really right. appreciate your um, comments about really a crisis in leadership and is, you know, anti-Semitism a passive overt or covert or conscious or unconscious, is, is that really at the root? And my question to you is, are there other countries that were, were doing a better job in response to this as a war effort of, and, and if I could ask one more yeah, question. Yeah, in, in terms of letting in refugees. Yes, yeah. and the children, you know, today in this, our own separation of children, I'm thinking, yes, if I were a desperate parent in Europe or in a war, that yes, getting my kid out, but that also that willingness to separate children and take it, it that seems so um, also a very a power relationship. We'll right. take your children. Right, right, right. So um, the, the way we talked about this in the museum as an exhibition team was um, the United States has a pretty bad record on refugees during, during the 1930s and 40s unless you measure it against every other nation in the world. So we're not, we're not letting in nearly as many refugees as we could have. We have these immigration visas and, that allow people in and, a, and a, during, between 1933 and 1941, when we go to war, about 200,000 are unissued. So what does that mean? We could have let in about 200,000 more refugees than we did before the war began. Um, these, these are rough numbers and historians disagree about, but, but 200,000 give or take 20,000 either way. So does that stop the Holocaust? No. There's no way the United States alone could have stopped the Holocaust, but could they have led in 200,000 more refugees? Absolutely. And why don't they? I, I think that there's a perfect storm going on of economic insecurity, national security fears, which then get tied to immigrants as invaders, um, and deep anti-Semitism that's already there. There are hundreds, um, one historian estimates that there's a hundred new anti-Semitic organizations founded in the United States in the 1930s. So anti-Semitism here is on the rise. Um, the unaccompanied children question is a really resonant one and difficult one, and, and, and even all of our talk in our political culture today about unaccompanied children, that's all happened since this exhibition opened in April. We weren't talking, unaccompanied children wasn't on the tip of our tongues as Americans even in April of 2018. I think we have to be, we have to be very careful about the Nazi analogy, right? And many people were saying this is just like Nazism. And I always encourage to say, well, wait a second, how, how is it and how is it unlike Nazism? And you're, you're pointing to that. The, the unaccompanied children who did make it to the United States during this period are given 
by their parents to refugee organizations like the American Friends Service Committee. The Quakers do a great job trying to um, place foster children. Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, does, a fantastic, does fantastic work trying to aid refugees over there and bring refugees here. There are many really harrowing personal stories of the decision that parents had to make to entrust their children to these refugee organizations, but they are entrusting them to refugee organizations to try to save their lives. They're not being forcibly separated by governments at that, at that point, at least, in 1938 or 1939. And I think it's important to remember some of the great work that those refugee organizations were doing in a network to try to save the kids that they could. Yeah. Um. Thank you. So I just had a question. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the State Department, yeah. with particularly like you know Cordell Hall and them. Uh, I did I did some research in Dr. Rung's class on that part of the refugees or lack thereof, and I was just wondering if you could talk about what you thought the motives were in the State Department and how, you know, because it was such a massive underserving of not just refugees, but even just, you know, handing out visas, right, right. both before and during wartime. So I was wondering if you could speak on that a bit. Sure. Yeah, the State Department's controversial in this history. Um, the, the, the State Department issues immigration visas, as you said. Um, the head of the visa division is a man named Breckenridge Long. Um, Breckenridge Long is a friend of FDR's. He is a dyed-in-the-wool American white Protestant um, anti-Semite. Um, it does not want to let Jewish refugees in. Until 1941, decisions about issuing visas, though, were made in U.S. consulates abroad. One of our national security, one of, our, one of the measures we take in terms of national security or in the name of national security is in, in the summer of 1941, the State Department changes their policy and says every application has to be issued, not it reviewed not only abroad, but also in Washington. That, so that takes this process that's already slow and grinding and, and makes it even slower. Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, had issued in the summer of 1940 a circular to all of those consulates and said, if you have any doubt about national security around letting an immigrant in, the answer is no. Keep them out. Um, and that really does hold sway. So is there a culture of anti-Semitism in the State Department? Absolutely. Um, is that the only explanation for, for lack of issuing all the visas? No. National security fears are real in the State Department. Um, and you do see some, counsel, some counselors abroad, like the, um, a man in Vienna named John Wiley, um, who wants to do absolutely everything he can under law to aid Jews in Vienna, but he also is writing back to Washington saying, I'm not going to break the law for them. Um, I'm not going to over-issue visas. I'm, I'm part of the federal government. I'm not going to break the law. Um, what you do see with that group, the War Refugee Board, that I talked about much later, that they're founded in 1944, they're government actors who bend the law um, for refugees, and some would argue break the law. But in, but in that refugee crisis period, 38, 39, 40, there are some councils abroad who, who want to do all they can to issue visas and others who are very restrictive. Breckenridge Long back here in Washington is, is very, very restrictive throughout. We have time for one more question. Thank you for an excellent lecture. <clears throat> um, you commented we didn't do anything to rescue the Jews. Um, there's a newspaper article out of uh, Detroit that in February of 1942, already two million Jews had already been killed in Poland alone. Um, there was no way we could have done anything because the planes couldn't fly back and forth. They didn't have the fuel. Um, in addition, the bombing was so inaccurate, we couldn't even hit the camps. Also, Ben-Gurion, Weissman, and FDR were not in favor of hitting the camps because they said it would kill Jews. Right. Uh, if I can make one other comment regarding those papers from Oswego, New York. Um, I have copies of the documents. And in the documents that Roosevelt had, it said not to notify Congress because it was illegal. Yeah. And that was the only deal he could make because they wanted to send them back. And it's, a, no, right, it's another right. sad So chapter. with Oswego, they find a way to make it legal by declaring, basically what they do is they declare Oswego a free port 
and they declare that, so the, and these are not immigrants coming to a free port, they're guests. Um, sometimes they're called goods and you see them um, wearing tags and under American law, you can hold goods at a free port indefinitely. So, they are, so these people are held as goods at a free port. Um, but the question of, I didn't talk about the question, really the elephant in the room on this history is the, or, the, or the, 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 the topic that many people know, the question about whether the United States, when they learned about Auschwitz, should have bombed the rail lines leading there or bombed the crematoria. Um, and um, there's no evidence that that question ever made it to FDR's desk. Um, some people say it did, some people say it didn't. It definitely, there were, but there are, there, there were absolutely multiple proposals to the War Department um, to either bomb the rail lines or bomb um, the crematoria at Auschwitz in, in July of 1944, again in November of 1944. Um, by the second half of 1944, it certainly was possible for for Allied planes to fly missions from Italy, make it to uh, make it to occupied Poland and back. We we are bombing German munitions factories four or five miles from Auschwitz. Targeted. We don't have targeted bombing. We don't know that we would hit what we're what we're trying to hit. But militarily, it was possible. And it's interesting to look at the the request from the War Refugee Board. The War Refugee Board, one agency in the government, asks another agency, the War Department, to do it. And John McCloy, who's the Assistant Secretary of War, responds. And he responds with three things. He says, we've studied it. No historian has ever found a study um, so he, ab about, the, about the, 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 the potential of bombing Auschwitz. So um, that may be a lie. Um, he says it's impracticable, meaning it's not militarily possible. That's also a lie. We were, we were flying those missions and, and, and um, bombing German munitions factories, as I said. And then the third thing he says is, it's not a war priority. And that's true. And that's always true for FDR's government, is that they see humanitarian aid as a diversion from, from the war effort. And that always, that always wins the day. That topic, though, is one, again, where there's, where there's moral, where I think there's a lot of moral outrage, right? Where we wish the history would have been different, maybe. Where we wish that the Allies would have sent a message to Europe or even to Europe's Jews that those victims mattered. Um, it's interesting to me to see letters from so many um, rabbis at the head of Jewish organizations who, who um, at the time were asking for Auschwitz to be bombed and then others debating no, um, prisoners might die. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a kind of moral debate going on there. But, but the, this question of the bombing of Auschwitz has gotten kind of, again, kind of lifted out of this history one of the things that we try to show in reframing this history is that the government's policy about not bombing Auschwitz was actually absolutely consistent with their policy all the way along. Their policy is defeat Nazism and win the war. Um, and they see these humanitarian, what we would today call humanitarian efforts, as a diversion. Um, and so they never attempt it. All right. Um, before we close, I just wanted to um, present our speaker today with a small memento of our appreciation um, of the perhaps imperfect leader. Um, however, it, it does represent the Center for New Deal Studies. This is a, from our collection. Um, so thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thanks Green. Thank you. Thanks.